Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Number 9, Sunday, July 31st, 2016. The lesson is entitled Raised to New Life. The lesson comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, verses 12 through 14, and verses 20 through 23. We were asked to read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. The place is from Corinth. The time is 56 A.D. George Fox inadvertently founded the Quaker movement in England by going around convincing normal Christians of who they were and how they should live as Christians. He called these encounters convincements, not conversions. In your class, you may have some professing Christians who evidence very little of changed life. Their attitudes and appetites may, may make you wonder about them. When were they converted? What part of them was converted and what was not? All the positive testimonies in the world are of no avail if there is not a new life present. A new life in Christ is the best possible testimony. If you, as their teacher, can show them what they have in Christ and get them to embrace their new life in him, your ministry will not be in vain. It is also one of the best evangelistic efforts you can put forth today's aim. Facts. To see the foundations of the new life in Christ. Principle. To understand that we are meant to live the new life in Christ. Application. To embrace the new life and cooperate with God in its implementation. Illustrating the lesson. The new life in Christ makes us willing slaves to God. Golden text. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4. Introduction. It may be hard to believe, but there are people in our prisons who do not want their freedom. When one inmate was released, he walked out of the prison and immediately stole a car and drove it to a rest area where he waited for the police to arrive and arrest him. In many ways, prison was all he knew and he had grown comfortable with it. He knew freedom required great responsibility and would bring great temptation and he was not prepared for that. It was much easier and more comfortable for him to remain behind bars. Freedom is not always easy to handle. As unbelievers, we were servants of sin, and we were comfortable with that. When we chose to follow Christ, however, the battle began. We were declared righteous through faith in Christ and freed from sin and its consequences. Yet we soon realized that we were not free from temptation or all ungodly desires. We were still quite capable of sin and all too frequently fell into it. Following Christ is not easy. We are engaged in a constant battle. Today we have three outlines. The first, believers are dead to sin, Romans 6, 1 through 4. The second, believers are instruments of righteousness, Romans 6, 12 through 14. And the third, believers are servants of God, Romans 6, 20 through 23. Believers are dead to sin. Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that unlike like that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We cannot continue in sin. Romans 6, 1 through 2. The Apostle Paul had explained in detail that justification is a gracious act of God received by faith in Christ apart from works. He declared that no matter how great sin is, grace is always greater. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 520. Paul then addressed a question that was sure to be raised. Shall we continue in sin? 
that grace may abound. 6 1. In other words, if grace abounds because of sin, should we sin to make sure grace continues to abound? This may sound like a strange question, but it is one that people have often asked or at least implied. Another that many people ask is, if salvation has nothing to do with works, then why should it matter if we continue to sin? Paul answered his own question with, God forbid, Romans 6, 2, or more literally, may it never be. For a Christian continuing to live in sin is not only imp impermissible, it is impossible. Because this is every true believer in Christ is dead to sin and thus can no longer live in it. Paul, of course, was not denying that Christians can and do sin. The idea is that believers will not continue in sin as a habitual way of life. This is what 1 John 3, 9 means when it uses the present continuance tense to declare. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. While there will be acts of sin on occasion, the course of a believer's life is characterized by obedience to God, not sin. The apostle described believers as dead to sin. When we place our faith in Christ, we die to sin in the sense that we pronounce allegiance to our sinful selves and to all the allurements and enticements of this sinful world. Thus, Paul asked how we who are dead to sin can continue in it. It is impossible. We are identified with Christ, Romans 6, 3 through 4. While Christians can sin, we cannot be dominated and controlled by sin because we are dead to it. At the same time, we struggle with certain sins and are not as consistent in living for Christ as we should be. How do we grow more like Christ and consistently gain victory over sin? The key to this is understanding our identification with Christ. Romans 6, 3 says that Christians were baptized into Jesus Christ. This speaks of the spiritual reality of our union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This union is affected by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, who brings us into the church, the body of Christ, and identifies us with him, Colossians 2, 12. In a spiritual sense, in God's eyes, we died when Christ died, we were buried when he was buried, and we rose to a new life when he rose to life. All of this is pictured by our water baptism, but the basic idea of baptism in this passage is that of identification. Because we are so closely identified with Christ, we have died to sin and been raised to newness of life, Romans 6, 4. In Christ, we have been raised to a new life that is completely cut off from sin. We are no longer under sin's dominion. And while we can give in to sin on occasion, we cannot continually live sin. Christ's death on the cross not only paid for our sins, but also provided for our daily victory over sin. Our identification with Christ has broken the power of sin. Therefore, we can walk in the new life Christ has given us, continually growing more Christ-like and becoming less prone to sin. Believers are instruments of righteousness. Verse 11. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. We must not let sin reign. Romans 6 verse 12, Paul said, we are dead to sin and we are to keep on considering this to be true, for it is true in fact. However, it is not enough to simply acknowledge this truth, for while believers will not continually sin, they can still sin and must guard against the dangers of surrendering to evil passions. 
passions which are often associated with the body and its functions. A body which in man's fallen state tends towards sin. We must yield ourselves to God. Romans 6, 13 through 14. There are many temptations that appeal to our bodily desires and appetites, but we must not yield our members as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness unto sin. The members here are parts of our bodies in verses 6 and 12. What Paul stated in verse 12 about the whole body is stated more particularly here in reference to individual parts of the body. We are not to yield any part of our bodies to sin. To yield something is to present it for service. We are to be sure no part of our bodies or lives is given over to the service of sin. That is like giving a weapon to the enemy. It is wholly inconsistent for one who has been raised spiritually from death to life by God to give aid to God's enemy. Sadly, many Christians live divided lives, seeking to serve God with one part of their lives while still indulging sinful pleasures. Instead of this, we are to present ourselves to God with the members of our bodies being instruments or weapons of righteousness for his use. We should not think of this struggle with sin as just a matter of willpower. The victory is won by God through Christ alone. We will lose some battles along the way, and we must learn to continually yield ourselves to God so that those losses become fewer and fewer. But the outcome of the war is determined. Paul made this clear by declaring that sin would not exercise dominion over us. Sin will not rule over Christ's followers because he has broken its power and majesty. The last part of Romans 6.14 is a promise that, assu that assures believers that sin cannot rule over them. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. To live under the law is to live under the power of sin. The law reveals sin 3.20 and establishes the guilt of sinners. Verse 19, the Mosaic law cannot save sinners. In fact, it gives strength to sin. 1 Corinthians 1556. But it was designed to point people to Christ. Galatians 3, 23 to 24, by showing them their sinfulness and need of God's grace. It cannot deliver people from sin's power. Only the grace of God as revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ can liberate us from the power of sin. Sin has no dominion over us because in Christ, the power of sin has been abolished by the grace of God. Because we live under grace and not the law, we are assured that sin does not have dominion over us. We are not under the law that constantly condemns us and offers us no power over sin, but we are under grace as our rule of life. For Christians, the law has been superseded by the new covenant of grace in Christ. Hebrews 8 6 through 13. Grace has freed us from sin's power and given us a new pattern for living. We are saved by grace and we walk in great God's grace, freed from the power of sin. Believers of servants of God. Verse 20. For when we were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Serving sin brings death, Romans 6, 20 through 21. In the first 14 verses of Romans 6, Paul was addressing the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1, beginning in verse 15, he addressed the question, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? While the emphasis are different, both questions concern the believer's relationship to sin, and both draw Paul's strong response, God forbid. Being under grace as Christians, 
are does not mean we are free to sin. In fact, the exact opposite is the case. Because we have claimed Christ as our master, we are no longer slaves to sin and we once as we once were. When we were unbelievers, sin was our master and we were free in regard to righteousness. That is, we were not at all influenced by righteousness and had no desire to be righteous. The implied contrast here is that we who are now believers in Christ are servants of righteousness and have no connection with sin. Paul left no middle ground here. We serve either sin or righteousness. We cannot serve both. Paul then reminded his readers of their lives before coming to Christ and asked what fruit their ungodly lives had produced from works and habits of which they were now ashamed. Romans 6 21. He then answered his own question, declaring that the end result of such things is death. If we are truly ashamed of our past sinful lives, now that we are believers, we are less inclined to repeat those sins. We are also less inclined to excuse them when we understand that those sins to which we were previously enslaved were leading us to eternal death. Serving God brings life, Romans 6, 22 to 23. With the word but, the apostle introduced a compelling contrast with what proceeded. As unbelievers, we were free from righteousness, verse 20. Now, as followers of Christ, we have been made free from sin, verse 22. Before we were servants of sin in verse 20, now we are servants to God, verse 22. As unbelievers, we were destined for death, verse 21. Now we have everlasting life, verse 22. The contrast itself argues that we should not and do not have to give in to sin at any time. If we are set free from the power of sin through Jesus Christ, we are servants of God, and this naturally results in holiness. The holiness that Paul had in mind here is the process of growing in holiness or what we call sanctification. If we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's Son, Colossians 1.13. We are no longer servants of sin, but are servants of God and servants of righteousness. We are no longer under the dominion of sin, and thus we cannot continue in sin. We are able to say no to individual acts of sin. While we will fail from time to time, the course of our lives is directed towards sanctification as we become more and more like our Lord. The end of holiness or sanctification is everlasting life, Romans 6, 22. We do not earn eternal life through holy living, as Paul himself made abundantly clear. However, the process of sanctification is one that leads inevitably to the inheritance of eternal life in all of its in all of its fullness. Galatians six eight, Hebrews twelve fourteen. As one writer stated, those who have been justified are now being sanctified. Those who have no experience of present sanctification have no reason to suppose they have been justified. Romans 6.23 is a brilliant summary of the gospel, and we often use it in presenting God's plan of salvation to unbelievers. In its context, however, it was originally addressed to believers or at least those who claim to be believers in Christ. As such, it calls us all to examine our lives and our professed faith in Christ. Paul was arguing that being under grace does not give believers freedom or encouragement to sin, Romans 6.15. If a person's life gives evidence that he or she is a slave to sin, then that person is not genuinely saved. For sin leads to eternal destruction. The power of grace must lead and does lead to holiness. Romans 6.23 thus declares, The wages of sin is death. Eternal death is something people earn because of their sinfulness and sinful acts. Eternal life, however, is a gift purchased for us by Jesus Christ and given to us by God's grace. It is not something we earn, but something we receive. God's grace frees us from the power of sin and always leads to holy living. Doctrine is always practical. 
It is only by understanding and applying the doctrine of justification by faith that we can live free of the power of sin. Yes, we must constantly and consciously present ourselves to God for his service, but it is his gracious power that has delivered us and will deliver us from sin and death. Let us examine ourselves to be sure that we are living holy lives in accordance with these great truths and not making excuses or seeking loopholes to rationalize our sins. Questions. One, what statement raised Paul's questions in Romans 6.1? Two, why is it not possible for believer to continue in sin? Three, What idea was Paul presenting when he spoke of being baptized into Jesus Christ? Verse 3. 4. What does it mean to yield ourselves to God? Verse 13. 5. Why does sin not have dominion over Christians? 6. What role does grace play in a believer's relationship to sin? Seven, what question was Paul addressing in verse 20 to 23? Eight, in what sense were we free from righteousness before we believed in Christ? Nine, how does pre-conversion life contrast with the Christian life? Ten, what is the difference between how eternal death and eternal life are required, how are acquired? This ends the Sunday School lesson for July 31st, 2016. Thank you for listening. God bless.